Welcome to Assessing Family History, Needs, and Well-Being to Improve Candidate Services to Families webinar. My name is Jennifer Gillison, and I am from Hoffman Associates, and we will be hosting the webinar today. I'd like to start with explaining a little bit about the webinar interface. You should all see the first slide of the PowerPoint presentation and the Q&A box on the right. We will be answering questions uh, at the end of the webinar, but you can enter your question at any time into the Q&A box. If you need technical assistance during the webinar, please use the Q&A box. Please note that this webinar is being recorded, and there will be a there will be a survey that will pop up at the end of the webinar. I would like to now turn it over to the moderator, Lisa Washington Thomas, Chief Self-Sufficiency Branch, Office of Family Assistance. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Our webinar on assessing family history, needs, and well-being for the systems, Family Stability Policy Academy sites, and um, any other people who are interested. We, we decided on this webinar because there's a great interest and it's one of two, gen, two generational approaches to poverty is a priority of OSA. And one of the aspects of a two-gen program is how they assess the entire family. So we are very pleased to have a wonderful slate of presenters uh, today. Again, my name is Lisa and I'll be opening up today's webinar and my colleague Damon Waters will help facilitate a Q&A session at the end. We designed this event to share information with you about family assessment tools and functions, but also hope it can be an interactive discussion on how you assess clients and their families and how you translate that information into service planning. Our objectives over the course of the next hour will be to ensure that you understand how assessing family functioning, history, and experiences can improve outcomes with TANF recipients and their families. We want to discuss existing tools that human service programs use to assess whole family functioning and how to hear about TANF program and to hear how TANF program presenters assess whole family functioning and use that inf information to improve service planning. Throughout today's webinar, you will have an opportunity to ask questions and chat. Um, in the chat box at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. We encourage you to ask questions, and if your questions were a specific presenter, please be sure to specify that. If we do not get to everyone's questions, uh, we will provide a Q&A that will appear on our Peer TA website in the Systems to Family Stability Hub, along with a transcript and slides from today's webinar. We are very fortunate to have three presenters who will be discussing family assessments today. Our first presenter, Jill, has a Master's of Social Work degree and is a licensed clinical social worker. She is currently the Administrator of the Integrated Assessment Program with the Illinois Department of Children's Services. She has been with IDCFS for over 20 years and has spent the majority of her career in the Clinical Services Division, serving not only as the administrator of the Integrated Assessment Program, but also as a regional clinical manager and regional clinical coordinator. Prior to joining IDCFS, she worked as an administrator and direct service provider in an inpatient mental health facility and in private practice. Our second presenter is Debbie Davis. Ms. Davis began her career with the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services in March 1981 working directly with individuals and families in need, in need to provide assistance with food, medical, child care, and case management to address barriers to employment. Since that time, she has served in various roles, such as a financial and workforce supervisor, regional workforce coordinator, community service division program manager. Currently, Debbie is the administrator for TANF and workforce policy for community services division within the Economic Services Administration of the Department of Social and Health Services. Our final presenter is Carla Aguirre and Marion Eckersley from the Utah Department of Workforce Services. Carla is currently the Director of Workforce Programs and the Policy and the Department and Programs of Policy and the Department oversees the administration of TANF, WIOA, 
Wagner Pizer, Trade, and the State Workforce Development Board. She has over 25 years of public service administering programs at the state, county, and local level. <clears throat> Marion is a program specialist and supervisor of the Utah Department of Workforce Services with 15 years of experience working with TANF policies, contracts, and projects. Most recently, she has been involved with the development and implementation of Department Next Generation Kids, an intergenerational poverty uh, program. So, thank you, and I'd like to turn this over to Jill. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. I am a presenter not from the TANF world. Um, I am in the child welfare world, but I certainly hope that I have um, the opportunity to present today how the model that Illinois uses for family assessment may um, provide um, TANF um, employees um, and staff with um, some basic um, foundation um, for uh, two-generational and family assessment. So I'll try um, not to be use all my child welfare lingo um, and stay focused on that. Um, the first thing I wanted to kind of let you know is that um, our assessment program um, is about 10 years old. Um, we really launched this program um, for children entering foster care um, and then bring siblings of uh, children in foster care. Um, and we also, for a five-year period, had a grant to work with intact families, which would be the services around prevention. We really needed to move from the assessment model that we were using, which was really basic um, social history gathering, to really move it um, to a more strength-based, trauma-informed, and family-centered model. The department is also and has been for a, a large number of years under a consent decree that required us to enhance our screening and assessment of children and families. And, and the Department of Children and Family Services in Illinois is also um, one of the only public tell over entities that is accredited uh, by the Council on Accreditation. We actually have what we consider a dual professional assessment model, which is extremely unique um, and really kind of is a Cadillac version of an assessment program. We're very fortunate in, in Illinois. We um, pair uh, the identified caseworker for the family and child with a licensed clinical professional who is the integrated assessment screener, and then they together work to assess the family and write the report and then move that assessment information into the client service planning. The caseworker brings with them the kind of child welfare expertise, if you will. The IA screener actually brings the clinical expertise, and then together they combine to really look at the family, both within the child welfare context, but also in the clinical context, so that that is a balanced assessment to move forward um, with service planning. The other component of the dual assessment process is that they work very hard to gather all historical information about families that have um, been completed by other providers, as I'm sure you're well aware. Our families are often very complex. Historically, we've used several different service providers and community resources. And before we launched the integrated assessment program, we had all of these individual assessments kind of out there in a client file, and some folks do some information, some folks do other information. Um, and this also provides um, us an opportunity to gather all of that information into one report within the first 45 days of the case. So we're not having information kind of floating out here that half of the world knows or half of the world doesn't know. Uh, so that's been a huge strength, um, both in the both in the assessment world, but also in the client service planning world. In order to make sort of a division of labor, um, it's important to kind of note that again, this is a dual assessment model, dual professional assessment model. The worker maintains responsibility for the case. Um, they write the service plan, they represent the case in court, and they, their worker and their supervisor are really the owner of that case because they're the ones that are going to carry that case forward after that integrated assessment screener is finished with the case and moves out. 
Uh, in a grade of assessment, screeners are contractual employees with the Department of Children and Family Services, whereas the a worker um, is either an employee of the Department of Children and Family Services or a contractual foster care uh, provider. Um, you can see the division of labor um, there. I'm not going to go through that in a great deal of um, detail so that I can kind of move forward and focus on what it is we're really looking for that hopefully can carry over um, and be in a be of assistance in looking at and utilizing um, a two-generational model. We, um, as I indica indicated in the beginning, we use a trauma-informed, family-focused, and strength-based model of assessment. Um, we gather information in all life domains for all children in their case, as well as all significant adults. What does significant adults mean? That means moms, dads, boyfriends, um, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, whoever may be a significant adult in that child's life or has been or is a caregiver for the child. We look at um, educational and employment history of our parents. We also look at that um, in our older uh, teen population. We look at current and historical health information to include pregnancy information, um, specifically around um, substance exposure, um, in any sort of traumas related to pregnancy. We also use um, the ACEs study and look at adverse child and adult experiences. We do um, a thorough assessment of mental health and social functioning. For adults, we do use some screening instruments to include the Edinburgh Postpartum Depression Scale, uh, the Child Abuse Potential Inventory, and then we also look at the Parental Stress Inventory. We will do additional assessment instruments if we find that there's symptomology that would indicate that. Um, and social functioning, how are they functioning um, within the community, within their family structure, and within those significant relationships they have? Um, obviously, substance, substance abuse is important to us um, in our assessment processes, um, domestic violence, residential stability, you know, kind of what's their legal involvement, have they been in and out of trouble, have they been in prison, um, are they on parole, those types of things. And then what are their significant adult relationships? And how have those impacted their ability to um, have stable um, mental health, stable functioning, stable employment, and obviously um, what impact may that have on their ability to um, safely parent children? We do focus on the six protective factors, um, parental resilience, knowledge of parent and child development, what kind of concrete supports are out there for them in their community, um, in their uh, church families, um, you know, within whatever social contacts they have, what is the social and emotional competence of those children? And then significantly, um, so in the child welfare world, what is um, the parent-child relationship? The Department of Children and Family Services also utilizes the child and adolescent needs and strengths assessment, both for our children and our adults. That gives us an opportunity uh, to really look at the strengths and needs of the family um, and utilize that tool um, in moving forward with recommendations for our service plan. We also do uh, developmental um, assessments on all of our children. Uh, we do utilize the early screening inventory for our uh, preschool kids to look at their readiness for kindergarten with a focus on any developmental delays, possible learning um, disabilities, language, social development, uh, those issues. We also use the um, ASQ looking at the social quotient of our children. Um, how are they interfacing um, um, and developing socially? We also use the infant toddler symptom checklist, uh, again, looking at trauma symptomology um, and experiences of our young children. We use the Devereaux and November, which really look at um, maturity development um, as well as uh, experience-based attainments um, in development. Uh, the use of um, the integrated assessment in our practice, um, and, and hopefully, and again, looking at a two-generation approach, um, some of the um, model concepts um, may be of some ass assistance. As I indicated, we look at all life domains um, that affect the education, vocational, social, mental health functioning of all of our kids um, and our significant adults. Um, we provide very specific recommendations to ad address safety, permanency, and well-being. Um, which are really the basis for our service um, plan. We prioritize those, obviously, in the child welfare world um, to look at safety. Um, 
the uh, educational and uh, vocational and employment um, components and uh, life domains really fit into our well-being component um, when making recommendations. Uh, as I indicated, we also integrate all assessment information into one report, uh, both for our caseworker of uh, youth, but also for our stakeholders. And uh, we also then provide a prognosis, um, and that's where the clinician really comes into play for successful achievement of uh, the permanency goals, and, you know, then what strategies um, are really going to be needed, uh, both for the family, but also uh, utilized by our service providers to help them have a successful um, outcome for those service recommendations. Um, the Illinois Model of Integrated Assessment, we have had a lot of work done um, with our partners at the University of Chicago um, at Chapin Hall, and I have provided um, just a, a handful of, of additional links uh, where you can go in, go in and look at some of the outcome information, um, analysis of the program at a much deeper level, um, as well as um, doing some comparative data. Um, around just an integrated assessment or a social history being done by a permanency worker versus the utilization of the dual um, professional um, assessment model that I've spoken about today. That concludes my um, presentation on the integrated model, and I'd like to now turn it over to Debbie. Thank you. I'm excited to be on the webinar with you today. Uh, I have been asked to share the process and redesign of our comprehensive evaluation that staff now use when they're meeting with workforce participants. It started in 2010 with a request from our governor, at that time um, Governor Gregoire, to redesign the TANF program. The principles uh, the guiding principles for the overall redesign were renewed emphasis on employment as the best route out of poverty, family-centered assessment and case management, parental responsibility and engagement to promote healthy child development, promote TANF as a transition to self-sufficiency by addressing barriers to employment while using a strength-based approach, leveraging non-TANF resources in the community and with state partners. Informing the redesign process was new data from our uh, DSHS research and data analysis team, identifying participants at risk of cycling on and off TANA and on the significance of barriers such as mental illness and chemical dependency. A key piece of TANA redesign overall was redesigning the comprehensive evaluation, also known as the CE, which is the assessment undergone by all workforce participants after their financial eligibility for the program has been established. Concurrent with the redesign and rollout of the new CE was statewide training of workforce case managers and social service specialists in motivational interviewing techniques. To make this happen, we contracted with the Institute for Individual and Organizational Change who provided the training. The redesign committee included uh, work first headquarters policy and operations staff, our information technology staff, and frontline field staff, as well as our work first partner agencies. That's the Department of Commerce, Employment Security, the Department of Early Learning, and the State Board of Community and Technical Colleges. The committee drew on a broad range of expertise in particular subject areas both inside and outside of our administration. For example, the Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery for Mental Health and Substance Abuse Screening, training, excuse me, screening. the Community Colleges for Learning Disability Assessments, the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence for Domestic Violence Screening, Building Changes, a local community-based organization for questions on housing stability and homelessness, uh, the Children's Administration for Child Welfare Questions, the Department of Early Learning for Insight on Adverse Childhood Experience and Executive Functioning. An initial version of the new CE was piloted for six weeks in three field offices, including weekly conference calls with managers and observational visits to see how it was going. Follow-up included focus groups with line staff and participant surveys and then revisions were made accordingly. 
There were extensive sessions with our IT staff to match automation as much as possible what the field was asking for. The new CE is divided into three main standalone parts. The rationale for the separate parts is to allow staff and participants the flexibility to address issues in a priority that makes sense for the participant. There's no compulsion to complete the whole CE in one sitting if that is not appropriate. This structure is also accompanied by a change in procedures so that the entire CE doesn't have to be completed as frequently. For example, a new full CE is only required if a participant has been off TANF continuously for 12 months. However, only part one or a shortened version of um, two and three are required if they return within 12 months. So let's look at the different parts of the CE. Part one of the CE covers basic questions to elicit the emergent need. These questions are designed to identify upfront if there are issues that need to be addressed. If the worker marks yes in any of the questions, they are directed to complete the appropriate sections in part two before developing a plan with the participant. An example of the questions are, does your family need housing? Do you or someone in your household have a medical condition or a pregnancy that needs immediate assistance? Do you need immediate help to deal with someone who has hurt or threatened you or your children? If the issue is severe enough, the worker has the option of stopping the CE and developing a plan to address the barriers or continue completing the rest of the CE if that's appropriate. When family is in crisis, it isn't always the best time to go through questions when the participant's focus at that time is on that crisis. In part two of the CE, we go into detailed questions on family functioning and well-being. The worker may have completed some of these questions during part one and then stop to address the barriers. The CE is a living document. It's updatable. When they meet with the participant after the immediate barrier is taken care of, they will complete the remaining sections of part two. This is where many of the questions are that look at the whole family. Questions in this section ask about accomplishments, skills, goals for, for themselves and family, what type of supports they have in place, how their children are doing in school, including prompts such as have they transferred schools often due to housing issues, are the kids attending regularly, does the participants volunteer at their child's school or child care, do the children have challenges, is there special educational plans in place for the child, do the children have health issues, do the children get regular health and dental checkups? Are they connected? Are they concerned about their kids um, abusing drugs or alcohol? Are there any legal issues with kids like arrest or truancy? Are there any custody or shared custody concerns? And for the older children, family planning questions are prompted. Other areas in this part of the CE include questions about child care needs, and the participant's responsibility for caring for any other adult, housing stability, adult health, and family violence. The section related to mental health and chemical dependency is the GAIN SS screening tool. This tool is comprehensive and standardized biopsychosocial assessment tool widely used in the welfare, justice, and school-based programs. Part three of the CE is all about the Employability. This part helps to complete the whole picture. It covers education, employment history, and experience. In this section, we talk about earned income tax credit, taxes, how they pay bills. We gather information on their recent employment history, if they were fired uh, or left a job, why, whether they have the necessary items like ID and social security number, and a way for employers to contact them. Uh, do they have appropriate clothing? Is there any prior military service? Any special skills like operating equipment or machining, machinery or keyboarding? 
Excuse me. We also ask about their job interests and training needs in this section, as well as their educational level, such as do they have any um, certificates that they um, may have gotten? Um, how did they do in school? What was the what was easy for them? What was the challenges that they had in school? We also ask about their any criminal history or upcoming court obligations that they. Uh, may have that would affect their participation or limit the type of occupation they could have. This section of Part 3 also covers the transportation needs and their backup childcare. Throughout the CE, the worker is given prompts based on how they answer the questions and also have documentation guidelines. These family functioning questions help to inform the worker how the family is doing and help develop a comprehensive plan for addressing the needs of the family, not just the participants. Some questions also have a follow-up indicator that a worker can check. This allows the system to automate all of the follow-up questions into one area for easy access and review the progress of an individual or a family. After the CE is completed, the worker has a much better understanding of the participant and their family. With the parent's involvement in the decision-making, the worker is much better prepared to make appropriate referrals and develop the individual responsibility plan used when they, using what they've learned in their CE. This is a screenshot of um, what the, comprehensive, the start of the comprehensive evaluation. Again, the rationale for the separate parts is to allow staff and participants the flexibility to address issues in a priority that makes sense for the participant. There's no pressure to complete the whole comprehensive evaluation in one sitting if that is not appropriate. The new CE was also automated to allow the core workforce partners, employment security, the Department of Commerce contractors, our limited English profic proficiency contractors, and the community and technical colleges to add information regarding their work with a particular participant in specific update sections of the CE. These updates and the original CE are electronically accessible to the workforce partners with the required protections for participant confidentiality in areas such as domestic violence. In designing the CE update sections, each of the partners identifies specific milestones in their work with participants that would be highlighted. For example, Employment security milestone would be work skills assessments or resume completion. For the colleges, a high school diploma or equivalency or certificate degree completion. Staff have been using the new CE since July 2014, so not so new anymore. There has been some anecdotal feedback from staff that they would like to see some changes, such as questions related to mental health and the questions related to mental health and chemical dependency, more strength-based questions, and a better tie into the motivational interviewing technique. It is an ever-evolving process, and we will be looking at ways to improve the CE and will likely be doing a staff and participant survey to determine areas for improvement in the future. Thank you. And next up, we will hear from Carla and Marion. All right, thank you. Um, this is Carla, and I, I uh, want to introduce Marianne, um, uh, who has been the lead um, pro project leader and supervisor on our project that we're going to talk about. But um, first of all, I just want to start with, um, we need to get, we'll get our slide here going. Um, I uh, want to talk a little bit, and I've given you the, the website to our intergenerational uh, report. So I want to just talk a little bit about how we got to where we're at with our intergenerational uh, TANA family. So um, somewhat like, like, like the state of Washington, there was legislation passed in 2012 um, that, that talked about collecting data around intergenerational poverty. And so we've been collecting data in the state of Utah where we'll be working on our fifth report this summer. And I think it's important to know that, that some of the decisions that we've made has been based on, on data. 
And I think it's very um, interesting that when you make assumptions without using data that, you know, we're like, oh, we don't have that many people in intergenerational poverty. But when you actually start collecting the data and getting more sophisticated, you realize that, yes, you do and where those pockets are. And, the, and that the legislation that was passed, uh, the, mitigate, the um, Intergenerational Poverty Mitigation Act that was passed um, here in the state of Utah really advised or, or told the state departments, Department of Health, Department of Workforce Services, Department of Health, um, Education, and the, the, the courts, that you guys you really, you agencies and your programs, you, you really need to look at your policies and start to address and make modifications and changes based on on the data. And so that's where we started. And so we started with um, a program. We came up with a program for the Department of Workforce Services called Next Generation Kids. And so the three things that we talked about was, well, okay, we knew who our population was, and we wanted to be very specific about the population that we wanted to, to do a project with. We also knew that uh, because of the TANF uh, uh, work participation rate and engagement that we wanted this to be a voluntary project. So that was the second thing we decided. And the third thing we decided after looking at the data is we wanted to generally have uh, tests in different areas where there was a concentration of poverty. And so those were the three decisions that we started with and how our project Next Generation Kids um, evolved. So we did a lot of research and planning with our partner from the University of Utah Social Research Institute, and we developed a, a plan going forward with our first uh, project. And Marion will talk about the family assessment, but really this is about working with the entire family uh, with a, a, both the parent and the children in a two-gen approach. We also knew that from the research and the evidence-based um, research that we did that we wanted uh, to have uh, use some of the motivational in interviewing. We had some data around ACEs. We had some data around um, uh, coaching. And so we put together our, our project that was around the kids and the family, and we looked at the data around early childhood development, education, health. And, and economic stability, and these these actually became our, our goals and the things that we focused on. But our model evolved into having a family success coach uh, with a family-focused plan and assessment. We would joint case manage the, these families with um, other agencies if we had crossover, but that we'd have a clinical therapist on site in these pilots, which we did. But the other piece that was very important with this is that we realized that we couldn't do this by ourselves and we needed community involvement. And so that's very, very high level about how we got to where we're, we are with our project. Um, but we really had two main goals uh, to, to look at as we developed uh, this project. One was that we really wanted to reduce the risk of these children uh, being raised in households that were on public assistance, we really wanted to try to, to break that cycle and to test some strategies and, and use evidence-based uh, research to test those strategies, which is where we're at right now. And the second thing is we wanted to learn from testing these strategies so that we could decide what are the best strategies and interventions that we could possibly utilize in our regular can up our cash assistance program here in the state of Utah, and so those are the things we've been doing with our with our three pilot site or project sites. But the family assessment and that piece that Marion's going to talk about it is is key and a very important concept and intervention process that we've learned from, and we're and I'll talk about that at the very end about where we're going with that. But that's just kind of very quickly an overview of, of how we are, why we're talking about a two-generation approach and a family assessment. And I'll turn the time over to, to uh, Marion to talk specifically about the family assessment. Hello. 
Hi, I just wanted to start with um, when we started to work on our assessment and our, our Next Generation Kids program, we first um, looked at our Social Research Institute um, information. They interview our customers, and one of the, the number one um, item that customers identified of being um, helping them be successful in their TAMIS program was the relationship with their counselor. So we looked at that and we thought it's not so much about the tool that you're using for the assessment, but it's focusing on how you ask the questions and the approach that you use and how you interact with the customers to get the right information to make uh, to help them along the way. So the first strategy we looked at with our case managers was really to give them some intensive training on poverty and trauma and how it impacts children. We used um, ACEs, um, some training on executive functioning, poverty, and trauma on children. Um, and staff work both with both parents and children on the assessment. So it's a family assessment. They're not doing separate assessments on each. But when they are meeting with the parents and the family, they're asking questions about the whole entire family. Um, and we identified the needs of the family through the assessment and develop a plan based on those needs. Um, and the plan includes activities not only around the parent now, but also around the children and how to make the family successful. With this approach, um, as Carla said, we have family, what we call family success coaches. They're our case managers, and they receive this intensive specific training. We also have a licensed clinical therapist, um, and we do a lot of case staffing with community partners, um, including schools um, that our children are involved with to collect grades and attendance and things like that. Um, and to do this, we always we thought a comprehensive family assessment is needed to accomplish this goal. Um, community partners are needed for our resources. Um, as Carla said, we can't do it all, so it's always important to involve community re partners and resource, research all the resources that you can have. So beginning the development of our assessment, we looked at our objectives and outcomes. We wanted to start of what we wanted to accomplish with the project. Um, first of all, was the basic needs of children are being met. Um, we're asking parents, are there primary care physicians for both the parents and the children? Um, are children supported by adults influencing their lives? Um, we offer parenting workshops. We talk to the parents about um, discussing college with their children, um, discussing finances with their children, making sure that they're involving their children um, and talking about their future. Um, parents on a path are on a path to employment and occupations paying a wage sufficient to meet the basic needs of children. Are we offering training, uh, pushing training with these parents? And are the kids um, seeing that the parents are accomplishing training? Um, families are building assets to, for their children's future. We offer financial literacy classes for the parents. And also we um, encourage parents to open a children's savings account. We've, um, added a pilot within our pilot program, um, opening a 529 savings account for all of the children in the families. And then children are, are on a path towards academic success. So during our assessment, we always want to um, gather grades, attendance, test scores, and talk to the parents about their involvement in school and how they're doing with the kids. So four areas, four key areas that we identified um, to address that lead towards the success of children in poverty are healthy families. Um, we're assessing um, the family's access to health, um, primary care physicians, dentists, safety, and overall well-being of the family. We offer food and nutrition classes for the families. Um, financial stability. We want to assess their current financial situation and com complete a reality check with the families on their future goals. Quality education, we assess the parents' um, education and how they can uh, meet their financial goals. And also, we assess their children's, how their children are doing in school. And do the parents attend school meetings or are they able to help with homework? If they're not, we, we get involved with that. Early childhood development, any children in our, in our families that are zero to five years old, we provide tools um, for the parents to help prepare their children for school and we encourage quality preschool. So when we first started building our assessment, we started with the research and planning. We met with a lot of uh, community partners, researched their tools and how they're asking questions, what kind of questions they're asking. Um, we really focused on motivational interviewing for our, for our case managers and our licensed clinical therapists because it is their approach and the way that they're asking questions to get the customers moving forward. And we looked at what is working now. 
Um, as I said, the relationship is the key focus that customers have identified in helping them move forward. So we really wanted to focus on when we built our assessment, how do we make it so we're building a better relationship with those families. When we're assessing the families, it's really important that we look at the customer is many times the family support. We've identified this as our program. Um, many of our customers that have come over that are intergenerational poverty are the support for the grandma, grandparents, their parents, their brothers and sisters. And that's something that really comes out through the assessment. So it includes always more than two generations, which is the grandparents, siblings, nieces. A lot of times they are living together or they're supporting babysitting their kids, so we want to assess the whole family. Sometimes we'll get the brothers or the grandparents in and we'll talk to them about how we can move that family forward as well. And we also want to identify how the extended family impacts the customer. Are there positive or negative supports and identify those positive supports to the family that they can go to for assistance. With our motivational interviewing, um, we train our staff on assessment. It needs to be detailed um, in order to build a realistic and credible plan. So we start with the individualized assessment and identify um, each individual and their circumstances. Um, building the credible plan with the customer from that assessment and identifying little steps that the customers can do and the families can do together um, builds the confidence and helps them hope that they can meet their goals. And when the confidence and when they're not building those goals, we always go back to the assessment. So like I said earlier, our assessment is more about the approach. And so what we've asked our case managers to do and what's been very, very successful with this program is our assessment is a face-to-face -face assessment. We supply tools for the case managers and, and train them on tools. But when they are meeting one-on-one -on -one with the customer, we push the computer aside and have a face-to-face -face conversation. And as part of motivational interviewing, we deliver affirmations and make sure we're identifying the positives and gaining the trust of the customer, which helps build that relationship. One of our customers we've asked, that has been very successful with the program, we asked her about the difference between the way we're doing assessment now compared to the way we did it before where we were asking a list of questions. And she said she loved the way we did it now, and her comment was, I want to be able to see my employment counselor listen and their emotional responses to what I'm talking about and feel validated. So it's very important if they're feeling validated, they're giving us more information, which helps us build that more credible plan. So training the staff, we need to make sure that we're training them on the approach and building that relationship while they're always thinking about those outcomes in the long run. We provide an assessment guide um, for training which um, covers the four domains. So the guide during training has every question that we could think of that you might want to ask the customer. If the guide is not used during the appointment, we let the customer guide the conversation. So when they come in, they might have specific um, circumstances that they want to talk about. So we don't want to just ask specific questions to them and move on without validating what they want to talk about. So we let them guide the conversation while staying within the realm of our four domains. Um, we also have an assessment checklist that we provide to our staff, which after the appointment, they can check off which areas they've hit. And then we also do have a case management system. We just don't use it while we're meeting with the customer. So when the customers leave the appointment, anything that we want measured or report that is needed for reporting purposes is filled out on that case management system after the customer leaves. Um, we train our staff that assessment is not a one and done. Assessment is ongoing. Um, so every appointment is considered an assessment appointment. You're always gathering information to help build that plan and help the customer meet their goals. We focus on the what, why, and how. Many times, um, this is part of motivational interviewing, many times we're finding out during the assessment what we want their goals to be, and then we jump right into how, we can, how they can meet those goals. We take a step back and we always um, encourage our case managers to talk about the why with the customers. The why is often skipped and so when the customers are talking about the why, it actually gets them excited about their goals. So asking them how this is going to help their families. Um, for example, obtaining a high school diploma or a GED, how is that going to make your life different? Um, why is this important to you? What's it going to do for your family? They get talking about the positives and the things that they want to see and it gets them excited before we jump into the how. Part of our assessment, um, as we're um, 
gathering information. We help the coaches train and ide- we train them on identifying the motivators. What's going to motivate the customers to complete these goals, and what challenges do are they going to need to overcome to meet these goals? So that's where we need to identify resources, whether we're there through Department of Workforce Services or through community partners. We'll give them resources. And we identify the goals along the way during the assessment. So we take a step back, and once we identify, they start talking during the assessment about something they want to accomplish. We'll stop and write down that goal. Once we identify what they want to do, we also scale their motivation, confidence, and knowledge. So asking them how motivated they are on a scale of 1 to 10 and how knowledgeable they are, how confident they are to finish that goal. Um, And then asking them um, why it's not a lower score actually talks, gets them talking about the why and why it's so important to them. So this is just an example of a part of our quality, um, our assessment guide, quality assessment guide that the case managers use during training and they can pull it out at any time, but we just really encourage them not to use it while they're meeting with their customers. And this is the checklist, a sample of the checklist that they use after the appointment so they can check off what's been done. So during the next appointment, they can review that before the customer comes in and identify areas that they might want to accomplish during that appointment. So what's next for us um, in the state of Utah? We have learned some strategies from these three projects that Marion um, is that she talked about the family assessment, and we are moving those strategies and interventions into our regular uh, case management program, and we're calling it the family-focused case management approach. And uh, we started a training academy where we'll be utilizing this family assessment, making some tweaks to our regular program that's quite compliance based on work activities. and so it will include things like the coaching training that Marion talked about, motivational interviewing, a, a whole family assessment, uh, executive functioning, and trauma awareness. And uh, that's what we've been doing, and we're excited about the journey we're on. We still have, uh, haven't finished with our third pilot, um, getting all of the participants, and we're going to test a couple of other strategies we haven't done before, and so the um, story continues. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, Very great presentations. We were very happy to hear about all the different activities going on in the various jurisdictions. Uh, We currently have one question, but just a reminder that if you have any questions for our presenters, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, we can take some more questions, and if you could just submit those through the chat feature. But we'll go ahead and ask our first question. It was written for Illinois, but it, it does apply to everyone. So how long do all of these assessments typically take? And if you have any challenges with the burden that may be placed on the individual or the family, where is the information housed and who can access the information? So let's take the first part first about how long do each of the assessments take? Would you like for me to start, Damon? This is Jill from Illinois. Sure. We don't have really a set time. It really depends on the number of um, clients that we are interviewing in a particular case. But it can give you some general guidelines. Um, for each adult that we are assessing, it takes somewhere between one and a half and two hours. For older children, it takes generally around 45 minutes to an hour. And when I talk about our older children, I'm talking about 11 and above. For children who are um, 6 to 11, we're generally talking about 13, excuse me, about 30 minutes. And then for our little newborns, um, which um, most 45% of our kids are uh, birth to three, just to give you an idea. Um, really, you know, doing those developmental screens only take about 15 minutes. Um, so you really kind of have to calculate that based on the number of people uh, that would be, um, would be interviewing. Um, and we do try not to, and I know some other folks said this too, we really try not to, um, you know, really just sort of overwhelm the family and try to do all of this in one day. So we may just do mom and dad. We may do the child and the substitute caregiver another day. I mean, we really, really want to take into account um, both the needs of the family. Um, and we certainly also gauge the um, 
kind of mental health status, emotional functioning of our parents. Just, um, our assessments are pretty intense and um, can be really difficult sometimes, um, particularly when talking about trauma and family of origin issues. So we, do, we definitely want to gauge that and um, use um, our clinical skills in, in making sure that we're you know, not really burdening the family, um, both emotionally and from a time standpoint. I can finish the rest of this as well <laughs> um, from the Illinois standpoint. I, I kind of want to um, kind of piggyback on something that Marion said. And, you know, our clients really feel pretty validated by this um, a process. They, they really um, feel like it's important to them to be able to tell their story. They feel like our assessment team, which is the worker and the IA screener, um, are um, empowering them to be a part of um, their own service planning. We ask them, much as other folks have talked about today, you know, what are your goals? Why are those important to you? And we put those in the report. They read the report. Um, and we identify that these are important to them and this is why. Um, so many times, particularly in child welfare, um, many of you have talked about voluntary services today. I regret to say that most of ours are not voluntary. And so we definitely want to be cognizant of our need to really use expert um, engagement skills with our families and make them feel appreciated and a part of the process. Um, we house all of our assessment information in our state automated child welfare information system, which is available to all of our contractual stakeholders who are servicing our children and uh, to our court personnel. And if we have some outside service providers, we do provide them with the integrated assessment um, utilizing um, the necessary uh, release information um, consistent with, um, you know, them as an adult and for children 12 and older. Thank you. Washington or Utah, about, about how long is the, the process be for you? So this is Mary Washington. Our, our, assessment, our, our first appointments with our families are probably an hour to two hours each, are probably our first and second appointment, but after that, they're probably an hour each. But again, like I said, assessment is ongoing, um, so we're, we continue to gather information all the time. So there isn't a completion date for our assessment. And this is Debbie in Washington. The same is true here. It's the initial comprehensive evaluation takes anywhere from an hour to two hours. And um, as they update and work, it, it's dependent on what areas they're, um, they're addressing. Great, thank you. Um, so where is the information housed? Is it central and who has access to it? Is it on like a state server or somewhere else? This is Marion from Utah. Our information is on a state server, um, and our whole department has access to that information, except for the licensed clinical therapist assessments. Those are just the licensed clinical therapists have, that have access. And in Washington State, they're also housed on a state server um, in our what we call our EJAS system. It's our case management system, and our partners working with the participants have access uh, to the information uh, as well as all our uh, case managers and social service specialists. Great. Thank you. And another question came in. Uh, do, do the assessments only occur in the office or do any of you use, uh, take place in youth home visits? This is Jill from Illinois. Um, our goal is to always um, complete the assessment in the family home unless there are identified safety issues. Um, we feel it's extremely important to meet our clients on kind of their territory uh, versus our own territory. Um, that takes away some of that defensiveness. Um, however, again, given the population we serve, there are sometimes safety issues uh, where we're not able to do that. And in domestic violence situations, if we feel like there's not an opportunity in a home environment to separate the victim from the perpetrator, um, then you may conduct um, one of the assessments in a public setting, such as child welfare office, a court um, a building, um, or other community um, setting that provides confidentiality. This is Marion from Utah. With our... Next Generation Kids Project, we um, 
ask the customers what's going to be most convenient for them. So we will do them in our location or in their home. Um, with our current um, pro that program or TANF program, we do do them in our centers, which we may be changing based on our information that we've gathered. And in Washington State, they are done in the community service offices. Um, we have not explored doing them outside of the office at this time. Okay, this is Jill you. from Illinois. Um, David, I'd like to just make one other comment about doing them in the home. Um, we often find that um, folks present in the office of being like, mostly very organized or um, you know, having a skill set that they can communicate to us verbally. But when we go to their home, um, it's one of those pictures speaks a thousand words. And sometimes we're able then to confront some inconsistencies in the, in the verbal information they provide to us just by looking at um, their home environment as well as the interactions and folks coming in and out of their homes and that kind of thing. So there's some additional clinical value for us in child welfare to do those assessments in the home. And this is Carla. I'd like to add one more thing. One thing that I don't think we explained is our projects are not... Our three uh, projects for next-gen kids are located in the community. We're at a um, Head Start office in one and at two schools in the other two sites. And then our other, so we're testing that environment. Um, the, our other cash assistance program that we're testing for are done in our employment centers, but we do have the option to do home visits, and there may be some of that going on, but mostly it is taking place in our employment centers, but we're having a lot of success being out in the community. Great. Thank you all. And one last question before we close out. Um, there was one question that came in uh, for everyone, and what would you say is the first step that programs should, should take? What, what are those initial things they should consider when they're thinking about improving their assessment process? Hi, this is Marion from Utah. I think it's always important to look at your goals and outcomes that you want to meet before you start building the assessment and do a lot of research. This is Jill from Illinois. Um, one of the things that we found to be extremely important um, was to um, do some surveys of our clients um, and our uh, outside stakeholders before we started the process. And then we found it extremely critical, again, um, for a very large state and similar state um, run and administer child welfare program. So it was extremely important for us to ensure that we had all administration on board and that support and direction um, came from um, the, kind of the top down uh, so that as we met challenges, um, we, were, we were able to, you know, kind of move those um, up and down. Um, that administrative structure. This is Debbie from Washington, and I agree with everything um, that's been said so far. I also think it's important to include the, the people that are going to be doing the assessment and getting all the right people in the room. I think another really important thing is, is um, we call it, you need to have the ship pretty much built before you start sailing it. But you also need to realize there's some shipbuilding that happens when you're sailing, and you will have to really remain pretty flexible um, in in what you're doing and kind of have an ongoing um, evaluation process um, and not be afraid to change things um, if they're not working. Great. Thanks for those responses. So then I will actually turn it over to Lisa Washington Thomas to close it out. Okay, I just want to thank you very much. I just want to thank Jill, Debbie, Carla, Marion, and um, Jennifer and Damon. Thank you so much for your participation on today's webinar. We're exactly, we're one minute over. So we hope this session has been informative and look forward to continuing work with you. To the extent that we are not able to answer all of your questions today, we will um, place them on the Peer TA website, and that is HHS, uh, www.peerta. Uh, one word, dot acf dot hhs dot gov. If you have further inquiries, please contact me by at um, at my email address, L Washington hyphen Thomas at acf dot hhs dot gov. Thank you so very much. Please answer our 
a survey that will pop up after this is, uh, webinar is over. The information is very helpful in planning future webinars. So thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.